it was like three day bender, Jamie. And then on the, the plane on the way home, like so much so they were like, you've got to stop drinking now. Like the, the bar's empty. And like the bar's not empty. Go downstairs and get some more, <laughs> bring it up. Like they're like, nah. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Rugby Pass Offload with me, Christina Mahan. And today I'm joined by Dylan Hartley and Jamie Roberts. How are you both? I'm very happy. I'm probably happier than Dylan today. Yeah, we've already talked about this off air, but I've only just caught up on my sleep. And I haven't done this since, even when I played, I didn't lose sleep some of the time over a loss. But since I retired, I was so happy. I never carried a result and I didn't really, uh, rugby didn't impact me. But after that game at the weekend, I woke up at like four in the morning and I'm sitting there thinking about some of those decisions. And I was thinking about like, you know, Captain Hindsight, what I would have done in that situation and I don't know. I've lost sleep over it. I'm, um, I'm looking forward to talking about it. Tomorrow. Right. Well, speaking of lack of sleep, Jamie, congratulations, because since you were last on the show, you've become a father for the first time to baby Thomas. How are you settling into life with a baby? Thank you very much, Christina. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, awesome, awesome couple of weeks. Had, had a week off, uh, missed our home game against Leinster. Uh, but then go back to training on the Monday, which is real <laughs> kind of tough. <laughs> Trying to get back into training. Um, I have a newfound respect for and appreciation for rugby playing dads, like a lot of my mates who I've played with down the years have had kids before me. Um, and I never quite realised how, how challenging that would be. So, um, yeah, amazing few weeks. Maybe Tomos, it's actually T O M O S, so it's a subtle nod to the Welsh, kind of Welsh version of Tomos. So, I guess if he. If he doesn't appreciate his Welsh heritage when he grows up, he'll just become Tom. But he's a big boy. He's growing. Hopefully he'll be a rugby player. Well, look, we'll move on. So um, over the course of the Six Nations, in partnership with the all-new Isuzu D-Max, we're bringing you our latest segment, where our panel will pick a player each week who was the unsung hero of the round. So someone who went about their work under the radar, put in a real shift, and was the key to their team's success. So our fans have had their say and have voted for Tom Curry as their Isuzu unsung hero of this week. But Dylan, who caught your eye and why? Oh, do, do you know what? That's, I didn't know it was Tom Curry, but I was going to go for his opposite man, um, Tipperick. Um, I just think loads of the uh, the noise around all the young back rows coming through. And how old is he, Jamie? He's an old horse, isn't he? He's been going a while. Sips, I mean, he's, I think he's north of 30. Or he's there or there about. He's, he's played some footy and... I just think he's the sort of guy that is so consistently good. He's not just consistent in what he does. Like, he he seems to perform in every big game I see him play. Um, and for me, like, you know, he picked up me old mate on Farrell in like the 75th minute and with that big old tackle. But um, you look back to, I think it was a Scotland game, he made like a, a cover tackle, like his last tackle of the game was in almost like the 80th minute, which was brilliant. He's the sort of guy, like, I just love, he's, he's permanently class. Um, and when he was up against the young buck and Tom Curry, he performed unbelievably well. So for me, um, tips, don't know, but I'm going to call him tips. Uh, Tipperick for me was uh, my son hero. He probably got man of the match or something, didn't he? No, Tulupe Falata was man of the he match. Did. But mate, I, um, Justin Tipperick, fantastic rugby player. I like, he'd walk in the all black side for me. I think he's, he's that good. He's, he's proper, engine i mean the guy can he can run to, he can play a game for hundreds 150 minutes uh let alone 80 um but just a really smart rugby brain as well look he's not a massive bloke he's not one of these really physical back rowers but he's so smart in the way he goes about the field um, and has an unbelievable engine um proper proper rugby player and has probably been wales a standout player for the last three or four years now um, and he's you know developed as a, a big leader in that side. My own son hero this week, who probably isn't getting too much credit publicly, but I think he's been immense, is Ken Owens. Um, as a former hooker dolls, I know you probably appreciate his work, but the guy hasn't played in months and he's come back in to test rugby and he was magnificent at the weekend. I mean, you talk about putting some shots in, some real momentum stopping tackles. Uh, the lineout was excellent. I think Wales won 16 of the 17 lineouts. And that's an area of the game we've been kind of commenting, worried about in Wales, <laughs> certainly recently, you know, in an area where we think we've probably been struggling, but they nailed it on the weekend. And I just think Ken is at the minute is 
kind of heads and shoulders above other hookers in the UK. You know, if, you, if you're picking a line and starting test side at the minute, I, I, I think you've got to go with Ken Owens. Um, and that's a testament to him coming back, having not played in months, uh, I think something like three or four months, and, you know, walking back into that wild side and performing at the level he is. I don't know, you know, where you see the hookers are, Dills, and if you to British pecking order or whatever, you know more about hookers than me. No, g- genuine. Yeah, big, big fan of the Sheriff, mate. Um, he's a little bit different to what you'd get with, um, you know, like a Jamie George. But he, for me, he's the sort of guy that does the basics really, really well. And I think to be an international hooker, you need to kind of tick those boxes. Every coach wants a solid set piece. Um, and then defensively sound, he's a smart, like attacking player. He can carry the ball. Um, but I think, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you on that. I definitely see him as a, a tourist. I think um, Luke Cowan Dickey on, on that front, I'm a massive fan of him. He's kind of like all action. Uh, like the man rides a horse. He's got missing tooth. Like he's one of the most interesting, like, like he is an interesting guy. He is wild. Um, I've just got an image of him riding his horse topless like Vladimir Putin. Yeah, with the tooth missing. Um, bareback as well, no saddle. Um, but just for me, Dicky, uh, I was kind of a bit gutted for him because he, he played against Italy and he was probably one of England's standout performers and he didn't get the, the start against Wales. So um, I kind of thought that might have been um, his sort of moment to play in a big game because he's been around the team for five years now and he's only started two games. So yeah. um, no, I definitely see Ken Owens as a Lions tourist. Um and it's funny that you say he didn't play any rugby coming into that with all the chat around the Saracens boys not playing any rugby. It can be done, you know what I mean? Um, but whether it's the spine of your team not playing uh, and one player, it's a, it's a slight difference, I think. But yeah, Big Ken, do you know what? He was that good. I didn't even see him at the weekend. He's just doing his job like a good front rower does. Well, there you go. Thanks, guys. And thanks to Isuzu for their support. Head to isuzu.co.uk to be the first to test drive the all-new, smarter, stronger, safer Isuzu D-Max. So, it's finally been revealed that Fabian Galtier has been confirmed as France's patient zero, having gone to watch his son play the day after the Ireland game. Now, as far as we know, his job is not under threat, but his actions were pretty irresponsible. Um, and having caused such damage to the tournament and players alike, Jamie, what do you reckon his punishment should be? Oh. I mean, it's a tough one, isn't it? Um, look, pr- Premiership rugby is different to Six Nations, different people in charge. Uh, and it's going to be fascinating how it plays out, you know, whether France can contain, you know, their, their COVID status, I guess, guess every, get everyone back negative and continue to play remains to be seen. Um, you know, whether anyone else in the squad has, has caught the virus and may prove positive a bit later down the track. Um, again, remains to be seen. If that happens, I think their position in the tournament is in obvious obvious jeopardy. Um, as for punishment goals, uh, goes, I think if they, to be honest about this, if they have broken the rules uh, and they have you know, gone outside of bubbles or they've broken the rules that they should be adhering to, whether that's their government rules or whether that's tournament rules that they, everyone agreed on, they should face punishment. Um, whether the governing body will decide that is to forfeit matches or whether it's monetary, again, remains to be seen. But again, this is this is quite unique because it's the first time it's happened in the Six Nations, if that makes sense. It's happened in the Autumn Nations Cup. It's also happened in Premiership Rugby. But it's the first time it's happened in Six Nations Rugby. So that's where we're all waiting to see what, what plays out. I guess the... The interesting thing here is here, if they're, if they're talking about playing a game the weekend after Super Saturday, is, you know, Scotland's two best players play in the Premiership. And there are, I think there are Premiership fixtures that weekend. Now, who do they pay for their release to play? Um, do France, do the FFR strike a deal with their clubs where they have release of players? Well, there's so many things at play here uh, to play on that weekend. But I just... I've, I've just got this funny feeling that the Six Nations will shy away from awarding, you know, what we've seen that 28 nil result to Scotland. I, I just don't think they'll do it. I think there'll be punishment in other ways. Dills, I'm not quite sure what you reckon. <laughs> You've just given a really kind of uh, educated, measured approach to this. I didn't know any of that stuff. Um, 
I mean, I obviously knew he broke the bubble. I just think it's fucking mental. It's so French. Like the yeah. gaffer, the boss, the main man that everyone lo- uh, looks to that sets the tone and everyone's harping on about, I know, I know Wales are shaping up nicely for the tournament, but everyone was saying like, this is France's year, you know? Um, I know, I know. And it's almost like they shoot themselves in the foot, especially like when you're the head coach and there's a national lockdown and you're in the middle of Six Nations, you're recognisable. You're going to a rugby game. Like, what was he thinking? Like, apparently, I don't know. I've met him once. He's a little bit mental. Um, I, I don't know. It's... I'm just confused. I guess the hard thing is, like, you know, we're, we're here talking that he is patient. But we don't know that. Like, it could have been one of the players uh, who have left the club. Well, I think there's talk about some of their players going to have waffles or something before their game. Um which again is is deeply irresponsible, I think, as a as a management for that side. Surely you make it crystal clear to your players that they can't leave the hotel. I mean, we played out in Italy on the weekend and it's made crystal clear to us, look, lads, you on your plane, you're on the bus, in the hotel, you don't leave the hotel, bus to the ground, play a game, back on a bus, back on the plane. You, you literally do not leave you know, your group of people. Um, and so for them to do that at test rugby level. It shows a deeper responsibility from the French management players for me. So we are delighted to be joined by Welsh international and British and Irish line Dan Lydiot to discuss the big game of the weekend and also celebrate his fantastic career to date. Welcome, Dan. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Lids, how are you, mate? Triple crown winner. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of a bit of a weird experience, that. I obviously had 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it counts, mate. Well. It counts. And, uh, Check it on the CV. Yeah, well, yeah, it goes down in the record book, but yeah, you, you almost don't feel part of it, isn't it? Because I was there for, you know, two weeks uh, pre, pre-first pre game and, you know, 10 minutes into the island game, ACL goes. So, uh, you know, you don't sort of feel a part of it. And obviously watching it on the weekend, obviously you want the boys to do well, um, but you're like gutted at the same time because you just want to be there. And, and anyone that says, oh, you know, they're not gutted, they'd be absolutely lying, do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, but, yeah. yeah. I completely agree with you. Dolls, Dolls would have been there. I've definitely been there as well. Those emotions when you're watching the team that you feel you should be in do well are really difficult. Aren't they? And how I don't is share that. The, I don't share that. How's the rehab then? Um, you don't share that, Dylan? Of course I do. Of course I do. Oh, dear. Well, Dan, how is the rehab going? Um, yeah, it's sort of early days yet. So um, the physios are just popping out uh, to my house like a couple of times a week just to. I'm basically doing it myself at the minute, just trying to get rid of the swelling and just trying to get the knee sort of moving. So it's, you know, very slow to start with with the with the the, the knee rehab, but it's all uh, the surgery went well. Uh, went up to the big smoke in London to get it done, where everyone goes to see Big Andy Williams. So he sorted me out, and um, yeah, we just you know take each day as it comes now. So I've got my little routine, game ready, and all that sort of stuff, and my little exercise to do every day. It's pretty boring, but you just get on with it, the new. Well, and you worked, it's, you worked so hard to regain your place in the team after being kind of outcasted for two years. So can you take us back to the moment against Ireland when your injury unfolded? It seemed like you tried to kind of battle on initially. Kind of what was going through your head at that time? Um, yeah, obviously there was like, a, it was like kick chase. So I was like trying to get up the ball. Felt like someone brushed against me. And then my next step, I just felt something snap in my knee. And I was like, Jesus Christ, that's, that's not good. Like... And then obviously the pain hit, uh, the medics run on, they were like testing for stability in my, in my knee. And I think it was it's sort of shock and sort of things like that. So my, like my muscles weren't allowing my knee to move. So it was sort of like, oh yeah, it's, it doesn't feel too bad. I was like, oh, let me stand up. And I, I put weight on it and I could stand up. So I was like, oh, well, let's strap it up. See if I can run it off the old classic, innit? <laughs> um, and then literally we had a scrum. Uh, Island exited um, and then the medics were running on because they were watching it back and they'd seen the replay and then they'd seen like my knees just obliterated here um, and as, uh, as the doctor team doctor come on they um, I, I put more weight on my my leg and it just buckled as it, I was right in front of him he's like look you've got to get off so I was like I don't know he probably should have come off straight away but I've been like 10 minutes into the jersey from being two years out from from the Welsh team and I was like I can't go off now like this is it works like you know what I mean and, and obviously, because of the start of the game, adrenaline was flying, you know, a couple of big collisions early on. You're like, I'm into this now. I just want to get after it. And then I'm like, you know, Shepherd's Crook, I'm, I'm off. 
And then literally, as I like hobbled off the field, every step then my knee was just giving way. So I was like, God, I'm going straight to the tunnel. Um, the guy under my arm, Prav, took me into the, the changing rooms and I just stayed in the chain rooms like for, for the whole game and head in hand. So I didn't, really, I didn't know what happened to the end of the match. So, yeah, yeah. fun and games. That must have been so tough, mate. Yeah. What I will say, right, is, and I, I sent you this in a message, I, I think for you to get back in that side after two years out is arguably a bigger achievement than continuing in the side over how long, when was your debut, Dan? Was it 09 to uh, 10? Yeah, 2009, yeah. 09, yeah. So you're in the team from 09 to 18. I think your achievement of getting back in the side is arguably greater. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone in Wales is massively proud of you, mate. So it's, it's pretty brutal though, mate, 10 minutes. But even for those 10 minutes, it must have felt worth it. Yeah, like obviously there's no crowd there. It's, it's the world we're living in now with COVID, but, you know, to run out in a principality, you know, Dills has been there, it's a hell of a stadium and, and you know, to sing the anthems again. I would like, I probably got more emotional um, driving into Cardiff for that game. Um, you know, everyone's sitting quiet on the bus with their headphones on. Then I did for my first, it's like being recalled to, the, uh, to Wales for the first time, get my first cap. It was, uh, it's a bit mental, but um, yeah, for the two weeks uh, I was with the Welsh camp, I was loving it, but there we are did you, um, there you goes. did you did you have a moment like did you get your shirt the evening before or did you get your shirt now you know when you pull your shirt on to go play do you have a little moment like I, I remember uh, doing that because when I came back from I just uh, towards the end I got injured and I came back and played and I only played like four or five more games and I remembered every time I pulled it on just to like just think of that moment because it might not happen again and then it finally didn't happen again so for you was it bit surreal pulling the shirt on yeah it was almost like when we went to do like captain's run and i think we trained there once in the week and you know when you go into the um into the changing rooms it's like numbered one to 23 so you know where obviously six sits and i was like oh because it was just training i didn't know whether to just go over and sit in that spot or do, do we just sit anywhere do you know what i mean but it was like actually sitting back in the spot that i always used to sit in i was like oh this is it. this is it this is class do you know what i mean but um yeah it was, uh, I enjoyed it. Do you know what I mean? You don't realize, well, you, you probably do until you can't do it anymore, how much you miss it. Um, and then to get that chance again, I was like buzzing, but you know, yeah. who knows what happens in the well, future. Hopefully, you get the chance to do it again, mate. Wish you the very best of the rehab for uh, the next year. Dan Lydia recalled again to the World Cup, <laughs> mate. I can see it. Well, Dan, tell us, you know, how uh, did working under Wayne Pivak differ from working under Gatland? Um, yeah, I was only there two weeks. I didn't have a lot of time with the guy. But uh, um, yeah, literally, as soon as I uh, walked into the the team room, he made like a beeline for me. And he's like, oh, welcome, Dan. I can have a word. I was like, yeah, I sound like sat down. And he was just like, made me feel really welcome. And he's like, look, you're not, I know I picked you at your age to be a bag old. And I was like, oh, thank, thank Christ for that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, and he was said like, yeah, just just bring what you've been bringing in 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 your club rugby, and we want to get the best out of you, and, and you're here to do a job. Um, but is there anything you need? Just come to us. And I found that with all the coaches, obviously, I played with a lot of them there with Mel and with Steve, and that they were all you know very. They'd come over to you a lot, and they, and you could just go over to them any time. So um, no, it's, it's it's a good environment up there. Um, but like I say, it was only it was only brief two two weeks I was there. The boys felt like it was a lot different than the, the autumn internationals. Um, but yeah, I can only go from what I felt like when I went back in, and it, it was good. Like, it was good. Yeah, were those two weeks different? Uh, I think Christina's question um, was it different to, you know, that kind of classic day that we had and the, and the Gatlins, you know, a unit's weight split in the morning, then rugby in the afternoon, food was class at the Vale. It was probably the best thing about going back there. Um, was it the, the training much different? Do they break, you know, with the unit stuff different? The intensity of training, what would be different under Wayne than it was under Warren? Um, just more than anything, the way he's trying to play. Um, the days are pretty much similar, um, very much run the same. It's a lot of the same backroom stuff that people wouldn't know about, but you know, with Bobby and, and, and Benny and all, all them conditioners and proud the medical side is pretty much run exactly the same it's just obviously the details different um how pivac wants to play um but you know it's, it's a good mix to be honest um i think they've, they've done it really well and going back to the food i think that was the best bit of camp it's gone up like 10 levels since i was last in there oh, geez, I completely, jazz, 
<laughs> literally once i had my scan to say i was my knee was gone i like went back to the veil and like stayed there the night so i was like it's like the last supper and they had like a mixed grill on and i literally i was like elephant's graveyard by the end of it there was bones everywhere I just I'll take my boxes as well <laughs> what was the favorite meal then you had in the veil Dan? in your two weeks that you were there like a japanese night they did they had like a little theme night once a week and um, they had like all sushi, katsu curry, all stuff like that. It was like, it was unbelievable. Like, it was we, just um, like, I remember one one campaign we uh, we did like uh, themed theme nights, the same thing. We'd always have like a sushi night, but whoever we're playing against that week, we would have like a theme night. So like playing against Italy, like the food was banging. It would be pizzas, pasta. France was similar. I remember we played against like. Wales. No, no, that, that was still good. Like we would have like lamb roasts and something. What but about think, Ireland? Yeah, we had a stew and like <laughs> the chef basically got fired off the back of it. The boys are like, what the this like it was like the big morale day, you know what I mean? Like pizza night or like a roast, you know, it was the thing. And then the stew came out with like boiled spuds and mash and stuff. It was just like, what the heck? The poor chef didn't live it down. So speaking of controversy, the Wales v England game on Saturday was full of it. So Pascal goes there, must be the most loved uh, man in Wales this week, Jamie. Um, he is. Controversy-wise, let me get this out of the way straight away. I see no problem whatsoever with that crossfield kick. Um, I thought it was a very smart play by Dan Bigger. If that happened to us, and certainly when Dan and I played, you know, kind of defensive leaders in that Welsh side for many years, we would be kicking ourselves if we turned our backs and the ref hadn't pointed to the sticks. Uh, and we take full responsibility. Um, and certainly playing under Sean Edwards, he made the team very aware that you watch out for quick taps. Uh, Kieran Hardy scored a try from one, and you watch out for those penalties. And until the ref has signaled to the post, you do not switch off. Now, I think it's lazy defence from England. I think they got can have no complaints. Um, and I know, you know, the argument, Dylan will probably chuck in there as well, if you've got a ref telling you to speak to your team, whatever, he should then give you opportunity to to come back but I think then my that is my know, argument yeah then my <laughs> the ref says to your team in, Dan Bigger oh. very smart player and he's just asked the question let me know when time's back on bang blows a whistle thank you very much um, yeah. so I, I just don't think England got an argument on that one the knock on uh, the shoes on the other foot I think that's a clear knock on and how we can't give that I'm uh, I'm bemused right can I come in yeah I was waiting yes. for this Bye. As a, as a captain, if the ref says talk to your team, time is off. You bring your team in. There's only a, there's only a couple of times you bring your team in in the game. It's one if there's a, a, a bad injury, a bit like yours, Lids, where where time is off and it's clear as day. Water carriers on the field. You'll come in. You have a chit chat, and then you know the game gets back to life with a scrum line out, whatever it may be. The other time is when the ref tells you to talk to your team. He told Owen to do that. Owen brings his team in, and he's basically started the game without letting the opposition captain know. So at, at kickoff time, um, you know, when you captain a team, the ref looks the opposition captain, goes, you're right. And you go, yep. And he looks the other captain, you go, you're right. Yep. And then he starts the game. That is usually how the game restarts after that sort of moment. And I was confused and I'm sitting there in hindsight going, how would I have approached that? And Owen tried to, to do what he could but the ref just, it was almost like a prejudice against Owen or that decision. Like, he didn't even want to hear it. Like, I don't know. Like, I just think a, it was there, there morally There was a wrong. moment when Biggs has said, oh, can you let me know when time is back on, that the ref looks over to the England squad, looks back at his whistle and just blows it. That was the time for the ref to go, Owen, I'm going to put play back on. Yeah. Right now. And he doesn't. And I completely agree with you. I think he probably should have. But even still, my but how, how, how the hell are you supposed to talk to your team mm. and then get back into position to a, a position of strength? Because what, one, once the ref said, talk to them, you can't take a quick tap, I thought. Once he said, I, oh, I don't no, know, there's so much speculation. Everyone's got their um, interpretations of the rules and stuff. But I think as a ref trying to work with two captains, like that is a clear and obvious, um, I don't know, it's like he, just didn't want to work with them he didn't want to give them a chance um which i think is unfair and that 
you know, even like the second try, I've seen those given in rugby. You know what I mean? He lost control of the ball, knocks it on, knocks it back. I don't care. Those things happen in rugby. But the first thing, that doesn't happen in rugby. And that's what, like, I'm sitting there watching it going, is this is this guy, does he truly believe it's France's year? Because he's doing everything he can to... <laughs> Liz, you know. what's your take, mate? Um, yeah, it's obviously, depends which side you, you're, you, you sit on the seven bridge, you know? Like, obviously, as a, as a Welsh guy, you're like, oh, it's happy days. Um, How, can I can I interject? <laughs> yeah. You don't need to be that guy because you've won the game, points in the bag, like, it's done. You're, you're three in a row. But, like, looking back at it now, is that right? I don't think, um, like, Liam Williams' try was a try, personally. Um, but I know from experience playing with bigs and that, he is always sort of looking, like, looking out for that. So I think I think Sanj Liam Williams come up to him and it was like Josh Adams obviously over the far side he's like signalling like it's on you but without jumping up and down and waving do you know what I mean because he's done it so many times that crossfield kick to Josh Adams he did it in the World Cup so it's like times off but he's like as soon as he can if if the English guy's not walking across or got in place quick enough he's gonna have a sniff for it. So, like, fair play to Biggs. Like, he's he's across his craft, and he straight away he's like, his time on, it's still on. He's pinged and gone from it. You obviously, from an English perspective, yeah, you're going to be tamping because Owen Farrell, he he didn't get clear signal. He, he, that was what he was protesting, going straight up to the referee. Look, mate, you didn't give me chance to say that time was back on, so we could. Do you know what I mean? He 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 might have said to him, "I give you the opportunity," but he didn't. Do you know what I mean? That's what Owen's going to say. And that's why he was going after him. Um, I don't think Usain Bolt could have got there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I love that Biggs has done that. Like, as a player, you take what you can get and, and you push it. And we're going to think we're going to come on to this. Like, Maro's been pushing it and Maro gets away with a lot. But at the weekend, Maro didn't get away with it. So I've, I've got no issues with, with Adams, Biggs, like, um, and, and whatnot. I just think the ref, like, he just refused to to acknowledge a mistake. Um, and I think when you've got a fourth official there, like, did I give them time? And I'm, I'm surprised the fourth official goes really quiet in his truck because the commentary, they're all talking about it. Everyone's talking about it. And he had a moment to say, the fourth official say, we should probably just look at this. You didn't give them time. Um, you know, whereas the fourth official was pretty quick to, to review the red cards we've seen. You know, we've got head contacts here. We'll look at Tom Curry's tackle. You know, they're quick to come in there. But in such a controversial moment in a game, like the fourth official goes very quiet. He's probably French as well. Who's yeah, it? The question to you, the question to you, when the ref says to you, have a word with your team, does that have to mean gather everyone into a huddle? I think when there's a really loud crowd, probably yes. No crowd in the stadium at the weekend. Could Faz just turn around and go, lad, sort your shit out, roll away from the contact area? No, I, it. I, I think when the ref says that, in my experience, every time it's get your team in. And, and, and in respect to the ref, you need to show him that you're going to deliver the message that he's told you to deliver. You can't just go, lads, you know, and everyone engage with you from 50 to 70 metres away, you know what I mean? Yeah, look, as a neutral, I was even very confused. But I know, Jamie, you're like, oh, you don't have rugby knowledge. But I did find it very confusing. I was like, hang on a second. <laughs> so, Dylan, I'll, I'll, I will agree with you on that. Um, but look, speaking of Farrell, he has been criticised for his attitude and language to the referees throughout this tournament. So is it time that we start to see the disrespect and back chat punished with a card? Jamie, so, what do you well, make of that? No, or Dylan, know, or Dylan. Is a, he's a... He's a Fantastic player, uh, very competitive bloke, very proud captain of his country. I thought he played very well on the weekend as well. Um, is he disrespectful with the way he approaches refs? I don't think so. I think he's just very, he's very competitive. He desperately wants to win. Um, I, I, I don't see him as a disrespectful player um, in a, one bit. I just think he's a real, real strong competitor and he's been a wonderful you know, leader for England. Um yeah, I don't think there's a conversation to be had there with disrespect with Owen uh, because I think he's a real respectful player. And, and, but just take, and the, but take Owen the out question of it, around the language, like he, he's not swearing at referees, is he? Like if he's swearing no. at referees, there's an issue. But he, I see him as no different to Johnny Sexton. I see him as no different to Dan Bigger. Like these guys have got, they're like albatrosses. They're, they've got wings all game. They're, they're, like, they're like this. They're always at it. They're always competing. So do you know what? I, th I think it's... Um, 
it, it ties in with his post-match interview. Like he's damned if he does and he's damned if he, he don't. Like he comes across on TV and he doesn't complain about any of the decisions and people hang him out to dry about that. Like they want to see him rise. But do you know what? I thought it took quite a big... Um, I don't know, just sort of really good of him, like really stoic to just park it, not blame the ref, just say, we're going to look at ourselves, look at our own discipline. Um, and, you know, people saying, why isn't he showing emotion? Why isn't he, you know, kind of saying that the refing decisions were, were terrible? Um, so I, I think there's a bit of a, uh, a prejudice against Owen, which probably isn't fair. And the only reason I'm quite passionate about this has probably happened with me as well. Pe- people just assume and and make their own opinions which is i don't know i don't know what i'm talking about let's take the take the mic well no just on what you said there dylan i suppose it like i thought fair play to eddie and Owen because they did refuse to be drawn into it in the post-match interviews and since then goes there has admitted that he got both the decisions wrong so yeah obviously just going back to like faz when he did his post-match interview everyone was like there's all like little memes of him and stuff like that, like look out. But he's he's obviously gutted. They just lost a test match where he felt like, you know, they got to a place in the second half where it was so close and then they could, you know, kicked on and won. So, you, you know, you can't have a go at the guy for actually being gutted that he lost a test match. Like, like, like the boys are saying, he's like ultra competitive. He wants to win and he's just gone and lost a, a test match. So like he's bound to be like, obviously like absolutely tamping with what's just happened. Um, but he's, he's not like, like Dill said, he's he's not just going out there and, and blaming everyone else. He just talked about how they obviously need to control what they control and, and you know get better for the next match and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, I, he couldn't have he couldn't have won in that situation. And then then there's people fuming about the questions that Sonia posed to him, and then people are fuming about his response to them. It's like I thought Owen dealt with the questions perfectly, like any captain would, like Alan Wynn dealt with them. And Sonia, again, is doing her job and, and probing and, and trying to get some sort of reaction. But, you know, it's, it's two professionals going head to head and they're both kind of, she asked the questions, he answered them. Move on. And then there's all this blowback about it, which is mental. Fair enough. Well, Alwyn Jones was heroic once more as a leader and on the pitch. So is the Lions captain debate between him and Atoje now over after basing it off this weekend's performances? Like who would each of you be picking for your Lions captain? Yeah, it's an interesting debate, isn't it? I think, I think a skipper on a Lions tour, you've, you've got to be going on tour. Again, we're not going on tour um, with the Lions this summer, but you've got to be assured of your starting place or close to you know, you've got a pretty good idea he's going to be starting in that test side. Um, and, they've, you know, Warren has certainly done that over, over the tours that he's coached. Now, on, on one hand, Warren, he won't pick on sentiment. Um, but on the other hand, when you're talking about someone like Alan Jones, the guy just continues to amaze. Like, the, he's hasn't played too much rugby. He's been out injured and he's come back into the test side. And I, me and Dull spoke about Ken Owens before you came on, Dan, in the same breath. You know, hasn't played much rugby, been injured, come back into test rugby and bang. You can see they are test players. They are proper test match players. And uh, like for me, Alan Wynn, I would love to see him captain the Lions. I think he deserves it. I think his career deserves it. I think his form deserves it. Um it's just Warren has to be sure that he's going to be in his starting 15. And, you know, we've talked about James Ryan. We've talked about Maro Itoje. Um, you know, pick two out of those three. <laughs> it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating combination. But for me, I, you know, Alan Wynn is leading, leading that race for me. Dan, who do you think? I think, well, you don't want to see any, any of the guys get injured, but that's always got a massive part to play in it. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, we've seen it so many times before where boys have been selected and, you know, literally games before or, you know, the warm up games, they've literally had to go home. So that's always a massive factor. Um, Jamie said, guys won't pick on sentiment. Personally, I'd like to see Al, um, you know, be a tour captain, but I don't know um, the other guys personally. Um, just just be a massive pat on the back for his career. Um, but Gats you know, going back to the last tour. Warby wasn't um, Wales's captain going into the last tour. Alan Wynn was, but he picked the best guy that he thought was going to do the best job. 
Um, and he picked, um, obviously, Sam to be the tour captain again. So he'll he'll just pick who he thinks will be the best tour, you know, best captain for the job. Um, it'd be interesting. It's going to be interesting. You know, I'd, I'd chuck someone like Ken Owens into the mix there as well, because the guy has toured with the Lions before. He's a, he's a top, top player. I think he, he's starting hooker in that side at the minute. I, I don't see other hookers in the in any of the other countries challenging for that starting spot. And that includes Jamie George, who just hasn't played enough rugby for me this season. You know, he'd be a candidate for me as well. And Hoggy as well. I, you know, Warren rarely picks back as captain. I don't think he ever has in his career. He's always wanted the forward to do that job. But Stuart Hogg has been an unbelievable player this year for club and country and is, and is leading Scotland well. So, you know, I think his name must come into the conversation as well. This is this is really um, where uh, it's kind of picking up on what you said, uh, Jamie. If we have the, the the three tests here, there's no tour. But how important is the captain then? Probably not very. Thank, but yeah. surely it's still. I, a, I genuinely still, believe it, that. Like, but it's a it's a total have, privilege to be like no, no, the, yeah, captain. There's then. that. There's the gravitas. There's the honour. There's all that. But when it comes to match day and a training week. How important is a captain if you're not going on like a two month tour with 15 games? You know what I mean? Um, is, is there four or five guys that could do that? Uh, I don't know. Well, Dylan, who would so, you pick at the moment? Who would you pick as captain? I don't know. I'd, I'd look at the winner of the Six Nations. Um, it's not going to be Italy. And I don't believe it would be France. And then I think. You know, history for me kind of shows that the winner of the Six Nations usually dominates numbers in that squad. And I think if you want the majority of that team to work with someone that they've worked with before, you would look at their captain. So if, if England were going to win this tournament, uh, I would say you can't look past a couple of English players uh, as your front runners. If Wales win this tournament, you can't look past a couple of Welsh players. I don't think the Irish are going to win it. No, no, but genuine, you know, it's, it's a numbers game. It's um... Unless I remember, those numbers aren't going to be a, tour, a large touring party. You just can't, you can't envisage that. It's going to be, you know, gets his match day squad plus probably five or six other players. It's not going to be a normal size Lions touring party like if they are going to host it in the UK. And the other thing is, it's going to be a little bit different because this whole COVID, you know, playing how we're doing things are you gonna you might as well just go with tried and tested you know what i mean that's where it's safe to go with an allen win it's just it's just nice and easy he knows what he's gonna get um and if it's only three tests and they've got you know four weeks to to play those three tests it's just nice and easy i, I can see it going that way all right okay sam simmons for captain well, look, actually, speaking of Sam Simmons, um, all black flanker Jerome Kano has come out um, to say that he should be in the England team after England's back row were outperformed once more by Wales on the weekend. So, Dylan, why is Sam not getting selected? Is it a question of pride or is it a personal issue, Dylan, that Eddie might have? I don't think it's personal. I don't think Sam has done anything to Eddie or, or whatnot. Um, but I'll tell you what, the, the more we talk about it, the more it's probably not going to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, you've said that before, but I think yeah. England are at a place now where Eddie Jones has to swallow some pride and yeah. pick four players who are going to be not the future because you know that disrespects current Test rugby. You know, it's all about winning the next Test match. But I find it a minor miracle how someone like Sam Simmons isn't playing for England. I, I really do. I really kind of struggle to see. Obviously, Jerome Kano has come out as he said in this week, and he's a pretty knowledgeable bloke, a very experienced player and has played in winning sides. And he obviously sees something in Sam Simmons that he thinks would swim, not sink at test level. Um, and there are a lot of fans out there who, who are baffled by it. I'm sure Sam will get his chance. I know I know, we had his chance briefly um, a year or two back with England, but for me, he, he offers something that none of those back row players in England offer. Dan, in your view, who is the best England? Who is the best back row in England? Maybe not Billy on recent form, Simmons on, on form. Um, 
but we all know what Billy can bring. Um, yeah, if you're going on form, you'd pick Simmons and you. Um, Did you see Billy made the sick of most meters pass or, or through contact at the weekend? So yeah. I, I, I was watching your game, like you must put um, a big old bullseye on Billy when he gets the ball, right? Yeah. Because he's a big oh, momentum giver. Big is, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, but you, you do, you know, you, you pick yeah. players. It's like the big momentum givers, and you you know when they get the ball, you know you light up, you get excited, you want to get after them. Every time Billy got the ball, I'm talking two man. I saw a three man tackle at one point, and then you see his stats after the game saying he's making the most meters after contact. It's like, and then it actually really annoyed me that Billy did an article in the week saying he's almost like given into the media narrative saying Billy's not performing. But after the Autumn Nations Cup, he made the second most tackles in the tournament second most meters and carries in the tournament it's like he's accepting what people are saying about him when he's still going all right he's not doing what billy did a couple of years ago but the way eddie obviously wants to play the game billy is fulfilling that role but if you bring in sam simmons have england got that attacking shape to give sam simmons time on the ball like he does at exeter i think like obviously with sam simmons you start in line up like, yeah, obviously he's got mental feet and gas and stuff. But if you know Billy's running full tilt at you, you're going to send four guys to try and hit him. If Sam Simmons is running at you, will you send the same amount of guys? So potentially he'd maybe make a bit more yardage because he, he's powerful, he is explosive, but you're not sending the same amount of guys, if that makes sense. But if you know you've got to like gang tackle Billy or he's trundling on, which he still does, do you know what I mean? So there's that argument as well. You know, Billy, he's um, sort of, because of every no, everyone knows what he's done in the past, you've got to give him that extra attention. And what, what, he, what he's good at as well is when he's not getting the ball, he's still running them lines. So you've got to stick on him regardless. And that's where it opens it up for other people. So like when he's not getting the ball and other people are going through, maybe he doesn't get the credit that he should deserve because of that. Do you know what I mean? Um, it is it is difficult because every player goes through this in their career. When he rocks up at, at the start of the scene, on the start of his career, and he's international and he's bulldozing people, everyone's like, "This guy is amazing." And then you know, as his career goes on, you know, there's always there'll be people then just henpecking, saying, "Oh, is he good enough now?" And that everyone, all players go through it. And then you come out the other side, and then they'll be like, oh, he's, like you said, now you actually go through what he does." And then you're like, well, actually, he's doing a bloody good job at what he's doing. But because there's like these, these little mouse in the background saying, yeah, but he's not doing this and he's not doing that. People are like, well, yeah, he's not doing that. Like, so it, there's an argument. Isn't it funny? Both, like, so so, so that, this happened to me. Isn't it? happened to me, Lids, right? As soon, as soon as I went in for that with that England captaincy, it was like, I wasn't even in the top five hookers in the country. And Owen Farrell should be captain. Now Owen's the captain. They're saying he's not even in the top fly halves in the country, which is, it just shows how fickle it is. Same with like Mauro, we've, we've covered that. It's just, you know, Jamie George, take take the shirt. Now everyone's saying like Jamie George isn't playing well. It's like, man. It's a fickle you world. can't win. Sport no. is bloody hard. That's why <laughs> Dan Liddy is so brilliant because he's been doing it for a long time and he's back yeah. and he's going to come back again. He is going to come back again. Well, yeah, Jamie Dan, Roberts look. is going to come back again as well. Oh, God. Oh, that's an even better one. How long have you been out of a shirt? Oh, God, four years, mate. Imagine that comeback story. Three and a half years, yeah. That'd be a pretty good I'm comeback good. story. Arthritis is kicking in, boys. On that uh, World Cup. So we're going to talk about the France semi-final. Does that go down as one of the biggest regrets of both yours and Jamie's careers? I can bring you in on that, Jamie. Well, I've, spoken, I've spoken about it on a previous part. It's the biggest regret of my career. Uh, and I think the best chance Wales will have or have had in recent history of winning a World Cup. Um, yes, they came close uh, in 2019 against the box um, in that semi final. But just for me, with the side we had, with the momentum we had, and the quality in the team, I just can't see if Wales getting a better chance than that. Um, Are you talking about France? Yeah. Uh, France semi final in 2011. Yeah. I'd and Warbs, is that where Warbs dropped that guy? Yeah. Yeah. And and everyone's heart bled for him. I, I felt bad for him. Like that was, that was harsh, man. Yeah. Dan, how, how was that game for you, mate? When you reflect on your career and think about, you know, near misses or 
you know, the highs and the lows. Where does that rank? Where does that game yeah. rank for you? Yeah, you obviously, it's it's probably the top in it. It is, you know, you're one game away from a, a World Cup final and the way that the All Blacks played in that final, looking back, you know, they it was they didn't play to win. They were just trying not to lose against France. Um, yeah, France and, put you know, the willies at, up the, the ABs, mate. <laughs> you know, like at the time you think, ah, oh, don't worry, you know, in another four years, we've got the same side. Well, you know, it would be that much better, but it doesn't always work like that, does it? Um, and looking back now, you know, that was the opportunity, um, well, for our generation anyway. Um, but yeah, it does it does still hurt. And, you know, you see it like replayed on the telly every now and again. And you see, you know, like Shane Williams is like, oh, I wish I could go back in time. And I think Bomb said the same, Adam Jones said the same. If we knew now what we knew then sort of thing, that, that, was, our, that was our time. But, you know, it's in the past, but it's the one that got away. It felt like anyway, it feels like. Well, I suppose your incredible performances then got you a British and Irish Lions call up. So was that the proudest moment of your career to date? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Um, obviously, it's it's like it's like Olympics for rugby players, isn't it? Once every four years, that opportunity it doesn't come round that often, um, and it's not just you know playing for your country. Like you know, growing in where growing up in Wales, everyone like wants to play for Wales, but like when you play the game, you want to be play at the best, and you you want to put yourself against the best and playing at the best is obviously being a British Lion and obviously going on a Lions tour is an amazing experience. Um, but then to obviously go on and, and, and get a test cap, um, it was like, you know, massive icing on the cake. And before the, the second test, um, I got to captain in the midweek game as well, which was like a massive honour. Um, and, and like looking back, being in that team, in that team huddle, you know, like Faz, Manu was in there and like looking around like Sean O'Brien played I'm just like there's no way we're going to lose we got all these boys and they're absolutely unreal team and like, we battered the did we batter that day um, I can't remember now but it was just like it was just like unbelievable like trying to do a team talk I'm like don't really need to say too much because these boys are class so we're just going to carve up anyway do you know what I mean but that was our like last opportunity to try and be like yeah guts like pick me if you're, if you're struggling sort of thing um and then I actually I just started the second test then after, after that performance. So um, yeah, no, it was um, it's like a picture that you all obviously when you go on tour, um, Dan the photographer like takes loads of pictures, um, and there's a picture of me like sat in the changing room after I'm like like blowing my lips like thinking like I've done what I've like wanted to do all my life. Do you know what I mean? At that moment in time, um, I was like I was content with you know, what I had done, like like a massive sort of pat on the back. Obviously, after that, you have more aspirations and goals and that, but at that moment in time, I was like, I'm, like, I've done it, like, like I've done it, mom. do you know what I mean? That sort of feeling. Um, and, like, obviously, James Bond was in there, Daniel Craig, which was a surreal experience as well, wasn't it, James? Oh, berserk, mate. Berserk. We shared a few champagnes that night, mate, Jesus. Class. Dan, what are some of your best memories of that tour? Um... That was probably one of the the good, uh, uh, one of the best moments. Obviously, coming off the chain room, like brilliant euphoria, you know, won the test series. Walking into the chain room, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, that's that guy from James Bond. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, what's happening, pal? Like, give him a pro handshake. And he's like, looking at me, like, who's this guy? Like, sort of thing. But he's like, champagne flowing. And then Jamie starts singing, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and it's just going around the, going around the changing room. Um, and we went over to uh, to Dublin, like pre pre tour to have like a training camp, and we went out in Dublin. Um, you know, had a few beers. Everyone's like, you know, taking a turn to stand up on the bar and do a sing song, and you know, Phil's he's there. It was just like, you know, like players that I grew up watching, like Paul O'Connell and stuff like that. And next minute, you're having a beer with them, and that's what's class about rugby. And it's, it's sort of similar now with like. You look at the current Welsh squad, like Louis Rizamit, like he would have grown up watching George North and like now they're like, you know, good mates, like have a beer together after the game and stuff like that. That's what's like really class about rugby, I think. And Dan, but, like, we like we heard that there were a lot of good social nights out on that tour. So I want to know, like, who was the best value on a night out and maybe what was the loosest it got that you can share with us? 
probably after the after the last game, it was like was it like three days bender, Jamie? And then on the the plane on the way home, like so much so they were like, You've got to stop drinking now. Like the, the bar's empty. And it's like the bar's not empty. Go downstairs and get some more. <laughs> Bring it up. Like they're like, nah, you're not gonna be able to like get off. I think we stopped off in Dubai. They're like, they're not gonna let you off. We're like, we'll stay in Dubai then. We'll stay another week, sort of thing. You're like you almost don't want it to end. Um yeah, it was just almost like last man standing after the um the last test but um you're almost like you you don't want to go on and see another beer for like another six months after you come off that tour because you're just like soaked to the skin of alcohol and um but yeah no all the boys are class um uh, sean o'brien's like class banter on, on the piss um yeah, it's just everyone really um like sort of the backroom stuff as well like you probably wouldn't wouldn't know that much um like everyone like gets on like so well well you've got to aren't you you're going away you, as soon as you make sort of friendships and get them bonds going you're almost that thing that you fight better for family than you, you you know you do for your sort of friends and stuff like that so everyone you've got to be like a little family on tour um it's obviously hard with like selection and stuff like that but you like even when i see like the, the you know the physios and, and doctors from from the other nations that like, you always like share a hug and a handshake and stuff like that which is which is really nice well, look, Dan, on that note, we will let you go. So thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time and best of luck with rehab. Cheers, guys. Enjoy that. Cheers, thank Lance, you. Mate. Will you be down? Oh, you won't be down again. Will you resting in here? So if we got Ospreys this week down the brewery field. So, um, yes, let's hope we do a Good luck, mate. You'll enjoy that. I can't wait. <laughs> Top man. So, Cheers, thanks, guys. Dan. Well, that is it from us. Thanks to Dan Lidiot, Dylan Hartley and Jamie Roberts. And thanks to you for listening. More offloading next week. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts so you get it as soon as it's released. Leave us a rating and review if you can. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Thanks, guys.